Why is a Model 16 like a bowling ball? Because you can get the same amount of software for each. That is the lead-off in the editorial in the September 1982 issue of 80 Micro. And at the time, the Model 16 came out, it had Tristos 16 and a dearth of software. And people were not thrilled. That's how Xenix ended up on the Model 16, in the Model 16 family of machines. And in wanting to do more videos about the 16, I combined it with something else I was really interested in, and something I kind of mentioned in uh, one of my previous videos, and that is, I mentioned the deload command when I was talking about the Color Computer 3, and how it had the any error in there, but it did not have deload. Well, it did have, the D, the command is there, but it doesn't do what deload does. And deload is one of those commands that is listed in the extended color basic manual for the color computer 1 and 2, but doesn't really have any description other than it lets you transfer files in over the serial port. And there are two incarnations of that, deload and deload m, just like cload and cload m, which will let you load basic or machine language programs. So if I figured, I wanted to explore deload, it's not going to work on this machine, so I got myself another machine. This is my color computer too. It was an eBay special. It's got a couple of marks on it and it's got a Coco 3 keyboard in it that I had lying around because the keyboard that came with it doesn't work completely and I haven't taken the time to fix it yet but I also really wanted to get this deload thing going on. So I'm going to explore the deload command a little bit and then based on what I've learned I'm going to show you a deload server that I wrote for the Model 16 to feed programs to this color computer too. So let's get started. So here we are at my Coco 3. Let's take a look at deload on it. Now the reason I'm starting with it and working backwards is because this is the only color computer I had for many years. Until I got the Coco 2 that I just mentioned, I only had the color computer 3 and so the deload commands intended functionality was not available to me. The token is in there and deload command does something, it just does not transfer files. Let's take a look. So if I run deload, I get a reset. If I want to do a full reset, I can poke 113, 0, and then call deload. And I'm started back at the extended color basic welcome screen. Now, if you know anything about how the Color Computer 3's ROMs work and how disk basic or extended basic was patched on the Color Computer 3, you know that the, the 3 has copies of the color basic and extended color basic ROMs on board, and that the startup routine patches those ROMs with super extended basic. In fact, in my previous video about the hidden error messages, you'll note that I mentioned the deload command uh, because it was here, and that the disk extended color basic copyright message appears in the ROM even if the disk controller is not plugged in as part of the core ROM. And that way mic microware could get their name and the updated copyright dates on there. Anyway, so since the ROMs are in there, you might think, geez, I could poke the thing, or I could execute just the extended color basic ROMs without the Coco 3 enhancements and try and run the deload command. So let's do that. If you have a Color Computer 3, you can put it into a quasi Coco 2 mode, basically stripping it of the basic commands to run the Coco 3 enhancements by running a short series of pokes. So if I poke, oops, not L, H, FFD, D, comma zero, and poke, 71, 0, and AFCC, A027, boom, there we are, Disk Extender Color Basic 1.1, 1, 1, copyright C1982 by Tandy, under license from Microsoft. That looks exactly like the Color Computer 2's startup copyright, and in fact, if I try and run any enhanced super extended basic commands, they don't work. BS area, that's not going to work because it thinks it's an array. So what else can I do here? Oh, each screen one. Yeah, syntax error. So this has no idea. So hey, what happens if I run the deload command? Now, as you probably surmised, the deload command in super extended basic was patched. So its behavior is expected on a Coco 3. What happens if I run the unpatched one on a Coco 3? That happens the machine just crashes. Interestingly enough, no, seeing it's in the, that you're basically messing with the reset vectors and poorly, you can see that every time I reset it, the screen moves up a line. Pretty cool, huh? If I keep doing that, it will 
clear the screen. But anyway, the machine has officially crashed. The only way out of it is to restart. So deload on this machine is a dead end. So here we have a Color Computer 2. You might recognize the copyright uh, message. Looks a lot like the one on the Color Computer 3 when I poked out the patches to the extended basic ROMs and reran the startup routine. This machine does have the deload command. And in fact, if you run it, it will sit there. It appears to do nothing. What it's actually doing is sending a byte out, a handshake byte out over the serial port to try and get a host's attention. But there's nothing running on the other end yet, so it's just going to sit here and will eventually time out with an IO error. Now, deload's not very well documented. Finding documentation on it proved tough until I realized I have copies of the entire subscription run to 80 Micro Magazine. Particularly, I noted on one of the forums online that someone had mentioned a deload server program that had been written for a Model 1 and mentioned that it had been written in 1982. So I went through my subscription run of 80 Micro but didn't find it in the 82 issues, but I moved into 1983 and I found it in this one, March 1983, on page 190. There is a great article describing color computer deload. I'm going to try and hold this up in front of the camera. And this has a source listing for a TRS-80 Model 1 in assembly and goes into great lengths of, to describe the deload protocol as figured out by the author. Now this was written in 1982 again, so this was really the only source of information that we had that I know of for deload. In 1996, someone did post to Usenet and said that it provided some additional details on the deload protocol. Um, so between that, this issue of 80 Micro, and a copy of Super Extended Basic, or I'm sorry, Disk Extended Basic and Extended Color Basic Unraveled, I pulled out the information I needed to write my own deload server. This video started off with the Model 16 and a quote about it being like a bowling ball. So why is the Model 16 involved here? And I thought, well, you know, if I'm going to write a deload server for this, it'd be really easy to do it in Java or something else like that. If I want to live what it was like to live in 1985 on a Xenix box, I would write this for the Model 16. So let's take a look at that, and then we'll do a demo. So this is my Model 16 running Xenix. And as you can see, I have a file listing of my home directory here. Uh, most importantly here is dload.c and above it dload. Um, dload is just the executable output from the C compiler. Now, I went into this thinking, well, I'm going to have to write this in C. I've written C and C++ before. I actually learned a fair amount of C before I moved over to C++. And then moving into the big data space and having done web application tier stuff like WebSphere, which is very heavily, heavily Java-based, I went over to Java. As I mentioned before, I could have written this in Java or something else on a Linux box, and it would have been easier to write, and it would have been, it would have worked. But where's the fun in that? Let's not involve more than one retro computer in a project like this. So what I've done here is written, and I'm not going to go through all the source code, written all of the source code for dload.c. I did the initial write on my laptop, and then I pushed it over to source control, and then pulled it down to the Model 16. And if you're wondering how I did that, if you saw my video on pulling files to and from a Hadoop file system using UUCP, um, you'll know that I have a Raspberry Pi that's running a UUCP Getty instance and is listening for the Model 16, so I can use it to transfer files in and out. And then I can just commit them up to my in-house GitLab server right from the Pi. So this here is my deload server. And again, it only works with a color computer 1 or 2 because Coco 3 doesn't support the deload command. The interesting thing about this too, which I'll go into in the future, is that learning this flavor of C was something interesting. So a lot of things that I take for granted because of when I learned C were gone. So for example, the void and constant const keywords were gone. Um, strict return types on functions, function prototypes even, even the method by which functions are declared. Here, look at int main is different from your standard declaration. You might be more familiar with something like int main char, I'm sorry, int argc char star argv, right? 
that would be a modern quote unquote way of defining a function. That's not going to happen here. So what I had to do was rewrite this to fit the constraints of the C compiler that was on this version of Xenix. And let me tell you that took that took some thinking. Other interesting things. All variable declarations must be done at the top of the function. If you define them later, they don't work. The program blows up. And what's funny is it just gives you random syntax errors and then every line after it has some spurious error that isn't actually true. Uh, what else happened here? That's the majority of it. Um, oh, the other thing is writing in C meant that there was heavy use of pointers and passing by reference. Um, because the returns are return values and things like that in various functions are kind of funky, um, it was easier to just use initialize things, use pointers to them, worked out great. And of course, arrays are inherently passed as a pointer, so I don't have to copy the address. Um, so that's basically it. So how does this program work on the core? So how this program works is pretty simple. This is only part of the protocol. What I didn't list here is that the Model 16 is going to listen for a handshake byte. When that handshake byte comes in, it's going to acknowledge it, and the color computer is going to send the file name along with the checksum of the file name. The Model 16 is then going to pull the file name in, it's going to validate the checksum that it calculates, and then reply back to the color computer to tell it whether or not the checksum matches. At this point, the color computer is going to send a couple of what the author on the 80 micro um, article called flags to describe what kind of file we're sending and whether there are any errors or anything like that. So if the file that we're looking for doesn't exist, for example, flag one has a code that I can put in there to generate an any error, non-existent error, which I'll show you. Um, any error, you'll note, it was in my hidden error messages video for the Color Computer 3. Even without Disk Basic, the error message is in there because Dload used it. Okay, so once we have the initial handshake done, we confirm the handshake, the color computer sends over a couple of bytes and a checksum, that's the block number, uh, most significant byte, least significant byte, and then we acknowledge it, and then we begin sending the block. Blocks are 128 bytes and must be sent in always in 128 byte blocks, regardless of the number of blocks. And the way that you define that is by setting the first byte that you send in the block is going to be an indicator of how many bytes you're sending, um, or you can tell it 80 and just fill it with spaces and the computer will ignore the rest. Um, and then you send 128 bytes worth of data. This is ASCII data. In this case, I'm not talking about machine load loading. This is just basic here. And then you send the checksum. And the flag, or the, the byte here, that the control byte that tells it how many bytes are coming along is included in the checksum. So all of this up to this is included in the checksum. Now at this point, if there are no more blocks, the color computer simply says OK, stops talking, and doesn't say anything. It just ends. Otherwise, if there are more blocks, you go back up. The color computer will acknowledge the block or send an error, BC, if it gets an error back. You'll acknowledge that everything's okay. You'll get the next updated block count from the color computer three, or color computer two, I should say. Acknowledge the block count, and then you'll send the next block of data. Now, when you're done, when it runs out of bytes, you sent the last one, it will, again, the program will end. So that is the basic high level view of how deload works. And now let's see it in action. So, how are the machines connected? Well, here I have a serial cable that I've kind of strung along here. This little made it adapter thing here that allows it to uh, connect to the four pinned in under the Tandy 1000 keyboard along the valley of the Apple IIe by my Diet Pepsi can over to the serial port. So, this is just a basic connection. Now for the Model 16 to work right, I did a little bit of bridging for data terminal ready and data set ready, but the program I wrote actually does not wait for the serial port to become ready. It will just initialize the port and move on. So those lines are necessary for terminal program in Tristos or if I want to do any kind of direct serial communication using a lot of the Xenix utilities, but for this application it's configured to not wait. So let's take a look. Okay, let's see how this works. Let's take a look at it in action. So, uh, if I run the command with no arguments here, it tells you that it's looking for the deload server, which actually, I just called it deload to make it easier to type. Because if you've seen my videos, I apparently suck at typing when there's a camera on me. And the path of the serial port. 
Now one thing I had to do in this application is I have to configure the port within the application. And that's because the default baud rate on this is 9600 and if I change it, if I set the speed, it'll set it instantaneously and then flip it right back to 9600. And you can do some tricks like uh, open something up that you know tails the serial port and then leave it in the background and use STTY to change it, but it made more sense just to configure it within the application. This way I could configure it correctly. And the serial port by default does a lot of filtering for terminals, so I can open it in raw mode and configure the baud rate in my application, which is what I do. So let's give it a run. Okay, the program is going to start up, and I'm going to do this from two different angles. Uh, the first thing here is I'm going to go over to the Color Computer 2, and I'm going to tell it to deload a file called test. Okay, you see it got the handshake, got the file name, performed the checksum, sent the file. And the program figures out how many blocks it has to split the file into and then sends it. So let's take a look at the Color Computer 2 and see what it looks like. One thing I forgot to note, I apologize for the video quality on this, on this TV. Um, I'm stuck using the antenna switch box that came with the machine and it's going through a 300 to 75 ohm adapter. But this is the only TV I had in the house that would actually take an analog signal from this machine. So this is what I had to do. Anyway, so let's do that same deload test over here. You saw what happened on the Model 16. Okay, and let's list it. And that's it. And if I run it, it just kind of scrolls up off the screen. And I have another one, test 3 which isn't quite as obnoxious. How high should I count? Five. There we go. One, two, three, four, five. So that's it. Now, what happens if I load a file that does not exist? So... You get an NE error. Let's take a look at that on the Model 16. Okay, so on the Model 16 you can see that a handshake came in it got the file name buzzard. Checksum checked out, but it didn't find the file, so it updated flag one to send an NE or non existent error to the client. And that's what happened. But wait, there's more. So, in doing this, now the initial article had a program would allow you to save to the other side, to the host, by printing the serial port. And his program would listen for the handshake byte for the printer and it would then save it to a file on the Model 1. I'm uh, not doing that. I could, but I really just kind of wanted to explore the deload command. But I did do a couple of other interesting things for, the, for it, or one other really interesting thing, I guess. And that is, I gave something called a command mode. So, I just mentioned I could load a file that doesn't exist. Well, without going to the host, how do I know what files exist? And the answer is, well, you don't, but you do. So I wrote the program so that if you prefix the name with a dash, it will interpret it as a command to be run, and it will generate a basic program and ship it back to the color computer with the results of the output. So for example here, say I want to see a listing of the current directory. And I will show the output of this, I'll show you the other side of this when I, after I show you how it looks on the color computer, I'll run it again and give you an idea of what it looks like. Okay, let's give it a run. Here we go, deload server command mode, and these are a list of all the files that are on the machine, and I have it every 14, 13 or 14 lines, it pauses, adds an A dollar sign equals in key dollar sign, if A dollar sign equals nothing, keep repeating the line. This way I can pause the listing because obviously there's more than, more files on the machine than would fit on the 32 by 16 screen. So here's the next set, there's deload.c and deload. I have a file called farts, because why the hell not? HTFS from my HTFS bit, the Kermit binary, all sorts of great stuff. Now what happens if I issue a command that doesn't exist? Oops. Ooh, my M's not working. This keyboard needs a cleaning. Okay. <clears throat> it comes back okay, but when you run it, unsupported command. Now I only implemented the directory command at this point. I just wanted to kind of show off what it could do. Theoretically, you could have it change directories and things like that, but you'd have to come up with a scheme for numbering them consistently or otherwise sending it, uh, allowing the, you to specify the directory 
in a way that will fit in a file name. The color computer file name can only be eight characters. So um, seven if you count the dash to put the thing into command mode. So you'd essentially have to have the thing come up with an ordered list of directories, print them, possibly even in the dir command give you the list, and then you know cd to one or cd to two or whatever. But we're not doing that, at least not not, not yet. But this was, I figured, an interesting use of the deload command to be able to see something, kind of interact with the host without actually having to be on the host. So let's take a look at the process of running a command mode request from the perspective of the Model 16. Okay, here we are at the Model 16. Now I'm going to run both command mode requests that I ran before, and you'll get to see it from the perspective of the Model 16. So the first thing I'm going to do is run a supported command, the directory command, and you'll get to watch it do that, and then I'll run a second unsupported one. Here comes the directory command, and you can see that it says command mode request, skipping file check, building basic program, then it builds the program and sends the payload over just as if it was a regular file. And you can see it doing each, each of the six blocks. Okay, now we're going to load the one that doesn't exist. Okay, this time I loaded dash fart. Fart is not a command. You can see that other than acknowledging the name and the shorter program, I don't actually say whether or not it was a valid command on the console. I probably could slash should, but I didn't. But that is it. That is the overall deload server that I wrote for the Model 16. Though I do wonder if I could port it to some of the other older C implementations on this. So for example, could I run this on the Color Computer 3 on OS 9? How fun would that be to have a Coco 3 that doesn't support deload be the deload server for another Coco 2? Whether or not I'm actually going to do that, I don't know. But if you're looking for more information on deload and the deload command, <clears throat> you won't find it in the extended basic manual. Check out the March 1983 issue of 80 Micro, page 190. Um, it has a fairly decent description of the protocol, though you will have to look through and use the assembly language listing to really get some of the details um, the author did a nice job on the article, but there were some things that, to my method of interpretation, were not clear um, entirely until I got looking through the assembly language listing. But until next time, I hope you enjoyed my little deload server demo, and stay classy.